God, knowing God, accepting God, that one of the marks of their departure was that they didn't thank, they weren't thankful, they became unthankful. So much that goes on in our country today is not thankful or thanked for. We're not a thankful people, and I speak in generality, certainly there are plenty of thankful people, but all over the whole nation. We don't just sit down sometimes and meditate and look at how I've been blessed and enumerate things. In Matthew 6, 9 through 13, Jesus gave us a model to go by in praying. He said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I say that's a model prayer. It was given to the apostles before the church was ever established. That is, the kingdom of Christ ever was started. So naturally, thy kingdom come would not be what we would pray today, although following it as a model, we could pray about the kingdom. We could pray about the spread of the kingdom, the borders of it being enlarged for each citizen of the kingdom. We need to always have the attitude of thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven because it is done without flaw in heaven. That should be our goal here. I think it's important as you look at the text, that Jesus is in the midst of instructing about prayer, as we said. And He wants His disciples to understand that the traditions of the Pharisees regarding prayer is sinful. That doesn't mean everything they did, but much of it was. So His instructions are both positive and negative. On the minus side, prayer should not be showy. It should not be filled with vain repetitions. Now, I think you can't just look at repetitions. You have to look at vain repetitions. We all repeat things. We all learn from hearing others pray publicly. But every person, and this just doesn't cover public prayer in worship, but that is the emphasis. But every person is going to learn from others and they're going to repeat some things. The idea of vain repetitions is you're not thinking about what you're saying. You're just simply saying. So you can use the words you learn from others, but you make them your words. And you know you're speaking to the Father. So we don't want to engage in what would be called vain repetitions. Just repeating things. Saying something because I have to do it. They got me down for prayer today. We need to be mindful of how to pray. And the model was given because the disciples of Christ were saying, John's teaching his disciples how to pray. And we want to know how to pray. Every person who is a child of the living God and all that that implies should want to know how to go before their father in prayer. On the positive side, Jesus then gives us this example of how to pray. Let me emphasize again, this is not what the denominational world and the world in general calls the Lord's Prayer. This is a model prayer. And we need to use that terminology for to speak as the oracles of God, which we're to do. Now there is a basic outline for prayer, this prayer, and it's the same for us today, noting that it is a model. <clears throat> I say we're talking about worship. The word in the Greek language the Holy Spirit had the writers use most in writing about worship was proskuneo, which means to prostrate one at another's feet, to kiss the hand toward an act of homage and devotion. It was certainly a humble approach, but it always was an act of, of devotion. The idea of bowing down, the idea of worship and bending the knee showing in the body the Spirit's reverence to God. And just a side thought on that. 
I've heard some people say, well, I just worshiped in my heart. Well, it begins in the heart. We must worship God in spirit and in truth. But the way we worship God and the way we serve God is seen in our bodies. It's seen in our actions done by our bodies. And so we should recognize that the only way we have of showing our disposition of heart toward God and godly things is by our bodies. And thus, that's where our dress comes in. And our daily walk of life, seeing that our bodies to be given as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service, Romans 12, 1 and 2. So there is worship. It's this attitude disposition of mind, state of mind, mindset, and our actions is coming therefrom. The way that we de dedicate, the way that we devote, I've already used the word devotion earlier, ourselves to God and our respect of Him and all that it means for Him to be God, the great I Am without beginning or ending the originator of all things, that He is good and always loving, and to honor Him for being God and that alone. So in prayer, we're dedicating and devoting ourselves to speaking to God. Now, certainly a public prayer may very well include others because we're leading people in prayer. We're bringing to mind thoughts they should have that are personal to them as we follow the model prayer Jesus gave us. So when we're bowing, we shouldn't be just saying amen because the prayer is over without thinking at all about what was said or letting it guide us in what we're doing. In other words, when we have a public prayer, we're all praying. We're all speaking to God with the right attitude. So this worshiping God in prayer involves ascribing praise to God. Now, the, the, the word ascribe means to uh, attribute or assign or credit praise to the one who deserves it. We're to address God, notice, as our Father and attribute unto Him the honor that our Father deserves. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <coughs> God is honored when we call Him our Father because we are acknowledging Him as our Creator. The one who sustains us through all sorts and sizes of good and bad. The one who provides us with everything that's good. The one who is our protector. What shall man do to me? In the sense that he can't touch my soul. We're speaking words of glory and honor to God when we then pray, Hallowed be thy name. God, of course, being all that God is, is worthy of our praise to Him in prayer. And we have some great examples of praise in prayer, and they're found in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 12, 4 through 6, listen to these wonderful words of the great prophet. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon His name, declare His doings among the people, make mention that His name is exalted, sing unto the Lord, for He hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thy inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. It reminds us of the song, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise His name. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. 
Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. In reading from Nehemiah in chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, <coughs> now remember this is at the time that people are returned from the captivity and they're putting things back together according to the law. Then the Levites, Jeshua and Cadmiel, Benai, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hadijah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou pres uh, preservest them all, and the host of heaven is worshipped of thee. When we ascribe to God properly glory and praise and honor, we're worshiping him. And in every act of worship, in a public worship, this is what we're doing. All this should be behind the observance of the Lord's Supper and all that it means. The various hymns and psalms and spiritual songs that we sing. Our very prayer should echo these sentiments. They're coming from the heart, the inward man of a child of God. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It should be then that disposition of mind. And let this be clearly understood. Every one of us gathered in a worship assembly should be cultivating that disposition of mind and helping each other keep our minds on what God said they ought to be on. That's just all a part of fellowship and the worship. There is then where we acknowledge in prayer that God is the ruler of the universe and that we relied on Him. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jeremiah points this out as the creator of the universe in chapter 51 and verse 15. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. Another point found and written in Colossians, written by Paul in Colossians 1 and verse 17 reminds us that He is the sustainer of all things. Speaking of Christ, Paul wrote, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist, which means they are sustained by Him. We should at times sit down and just contemplate nature and realize the air we breathe, just the right amount of oxygen in that air, water, everything around us. God in His infinite wisdom spoke it all into existence and by His will, the word of His power, it continues to function. Whatever law of science there is, by the way, the definition of a law is simply a rule of action. And God doesn't work without rules of action. And all of His law is called the perfect law of liberty. James 1.25 and that's true concerning his creative law of physical things. So we ought to think about all these things. Do you ever just sit down in your backyard and contemplate a butterfly? Now you won't learn the plan of salvation from a butterfly. I didn't have to tell you that for you to know it. But realize what put that together and makes it work. The same is true of a bee, ladybug, or whatever. It's all there, functioning by design, thus a designer who has the power and wisdom to put it together. We acknowledge God's power in providing for our earthly lives. In giving us food and gladness, Acts 4, 14, 17 reads, Nevertheless, speaking of God, he left not himself without witness. 
We can tell that to any atheist who says, oh, I know God does not exist. Well, God's not left himself without witness. All these things in nature testify to the existence of God. In that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Now, those are very general statements regarding nature. But just bring them down to the details of what allows them to be and you see how minute God's creative design is. He's provided shelter and clothing for every one of us. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As I've preached in many places for years, our problem with that verse is not in our lack of ability to understand it. The language is on about a fifth grade level of English in the translation. Our problem is trusting God to do what we know he said he would do if we do our part. We acknowledge God's power in providing for our salvation. First of all, in sending His Son, Jesus. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In accepting that flawless, complete, perfect sacrifice for our sins, Paul wrote to the young preacher Titus in Titus chapter 3, 4 through 7, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In providing the plan of salvation through which man is saved from his sins, we read in Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, in giving up his perpetual word so we can have the pattern to live by. 1 Peter 1, 23 reads, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. When we acknowledge God has done these things for us, we are worshiping Him. Do you see how all of this begins from a disposition of the mind? Why there must be concentration on what we're doing? We ask because God tells us to ask. I think sometimes we get the idea I shouldn't ask for certain things. But he tells us to ask. Matthew 7, 7 through 8, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. I many times have commented on the Greek <coughs> verbs here that they are present tense and present tense in the Greek is not like present tense in the English. It means continual action. We call it linear action. It's just like drawing a line. It starts and doesn't stop. And we should always be asking and we should always be knocking and we should always be uh, seeking. If you do that all the time, God has said this will happen. For everyone that asketh, let's keep on asking, receives. And he that seeks, you never stop seeking. Fine. And to him that knocks, you never stop knocking, it shall be open. There's the key. And sometimes we don't learn and we don't get these things because we just sort of mutter something to God now and then. There's not a persistence. There's not a steadfastness. There's not a continuation. There's not a zeal. And yet all that's implied in asking, seeking, and knocking. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, John wrote to Christians, and this is, notice confidence. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, I mark that, if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. You ever wonder where God hears your prayers? I don't know how many books I've read or various TV shows. I just don't think God's hearing me. If you don't do His will, He's certainly not. But if you're a Christian, you've done His will to become a Christian. And if you're living righteous from day to day, you're doing His will. Now, does He hear you when you pray? 
Well, John says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. There's always the disposition as a weak, finite human being that we say, not I will, but thine be done. Because we'd be rather foolish to say all these things about God and worshiping God and then try to say you know better than God. But if you're asking according to his will, which is set out of the Bible, which we are to study and write and divide, then on specific things we're always asking. But we're saying not our will but thine be done because that itself worships God and acknowledges that he knows better for me in the affairs of this present world than I do. We ask because we know that God loves us and he wants to give us good things. I think we need to be reminded of that. In Matthew chapter 7, 9 through 11, Jesus just simply taught on the level and in the traditions of those people, or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? I mean, that still works pretty good today. People understand those words. They understand the, the comparison and they understand the contrast. And then he talks about us. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? Do you believe that? That can't be, you know, answered prayer by faith only. <laughs> we can't say that when He says believe. You're living your life in harmony with the will of God you know. And part of that's praying, being thankful, and asking according to His will. We ask because we truly have needs for which only God can provide. For which only God can provide. You know, the church in Philippi, Paul wrote in Philippians 4.19, and then I want to ask you before I read it, do you believe this? But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now we've got to understand what a spiritual need is and even what a physical need is. But what's the promise? He'll give you what you need. You believe that? In Matthew 6, 30-33, again we're noticing verse 33. But notice how it starts earlier. He's talking about, and it's not so apparent except by context in the King James Version. But he's talking about being antsy. That's another way of saying anxious. And he's saying, therefore take no thought. He's not talking about purposing and planning and reasoning. He's talking about worrying yourself to death about something you can't do anything about in the first place. Saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with with all shall we be clothed? Then letting the Gentiles represent people who are totally dead to the here and now in this world. He says, for after all these things that the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Well then why do we need to ask Him anything since we're His children? We believe the gospel being cleansed by His Son's blood when we were baptized to Christ. We're living godly lives. Why do we need to ask Him? Because He wants to see that devotion. He wants to see that reality manifest in our lives and our need of Him. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God wants us to acknowledge who we are, and that will move us then to acknowledge who He is in our relationship and dependence upon Him. We ask because we understand that God has the power to fulfill our request. How many people pray prayers because they heard people pray words in a prayer? They call the name of God. That's the one they're supposed to address. Not many people really, really believe He has the power to answer our request. The prophet Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thy great power and stretched out arms. And there's nothing too hard for thee. That's a marvelous statement. When you're down and out and 
your ingrowing toenail is really hurting. And you know, when you have something like that, your whole body goes along with it. You find out just how great a little thing is because your whole body will sympathize with you. Now I use that simply as a frivolous way of making a point. There's nothing too hard for God. What do you think that has to do with his children and his son's church? And you know, there are just not many of them and never have been in this world. In Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, Paul said to the church in Ephesus, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, I like these words, abundantly, above all that we ask, or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You know, we ask God things, we say not I will, but thine be done. From the heart we mean it. We ascribe him the praise and the glory. But we ought to remember, he'll do more than we ever thought he would. And he'll do it in a way better than a lot of times we ask, even though when we're asking, it's the right way. But then also, there's simply accepting. Accepting is a part of praying to God and worship. There's a difference in taking and accepting and accepting the great gifts that God has given us then we're thankful we're very thankful we sometimes sing or say little things in the small classes about the sun about the moon about the star about the fishes and things like that but I think we need to be saying these things in the big adult mature classes. We forget about all these little things. Just eat an apple and never think about where it came from. We just go down with a banana and never notice it. Never mindful of it. But we ought to be. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one as implied throughout all of the scriptures, both Old and New Testament. So we ought to be thankful for everything. Philippians 4, 6 reads, Be careful, which is again, don't be anxious about things. Be careful for nothing. Well, how is that possible? Now, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Got a big event coming up in your life? There's a way to deal with it. Beats an aspirin. or ibuprofen. <laughs> when we come before God and worship to Him, then we're to be thankful. Notice the psalmist in Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. God will do good for you. I remember years and years ago, Brother Nichols probably had a year or two to live, and he was in his 80s then at Street Harbor Lectures, as they once were, were done. He said, you know, I get here every year and see people I haven't seen since the last year, and said, now they know how old I am, and they're always saying, well, we're praying for you, we're praying for your long life. And he said, you know, that's much appreciated, and the a state of mind that would cause people to tell me that is just wonderful. But you know, it just could be that the Lord doesn't want me to have long life. So always say, not my will, but thine be done when you're praying for me to get along in this life. And I was told by his son when he was dying because he'd bedridden for a while after a stroke. He said when he would rouse up and they were trying to comfort him, that all he would say to them was what he said to them when they were little. it would be all right. He'd go back to sleep. Wake up a little while later, it'll be all right. You know, that's saying a mouthful when you can say that because of the way you have lived in service to God. God considers thanksgiving our sacrifice of praise according to the inspired Hebrews, right? In Hebrews 13, 15, listen to this. 
By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Thanksgiving is certainly worship to God. Now this afternoon, we've touched on some things regarding prayer. Major things, I think, as worship to God and what worship means. I hope it's been impressed upon you that we scripturally, we, we pray properly when we ascribe to God all glory and honor. When we acknowledge God as the only true one and living God. When we ask for the things that we have need, knowing He will not leave us unanswered. When we accept the great blessings that God has given us in thanksgiving. Somebody must have had that in mind when they wrote the song, God will take care of you. So if you're a Christian, look what you have that nobody else in this world has, a part of all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places that are found in Christ. Ephesians 1 3. Folks, all of us have burdens. All of us can spend more time in proper prayer. We'll do that when we have greater dependence on God and greater need of God and realize that He is really behind every breath we take. If you're not a Christian, you, you don't have this kind of blessing. The Bible never does say, well, just pray to God as an, air, as an alien sinner and everything's all right and you'll be saved. Just ask Him to come into your life. He's not going to answer a prayer like that because... There's a plan. A plan of salvation. How do I know that? And how can you know it? Because it's in your Bible. You'll never know it unless somebody teaches it to you from the Bible or you study it yourself. The only way you're going to know it because religion that is from God is a taught religion. That's why we're urged every way under the sun to study the Bible all the time. Meditate on His Word day and night. So there's a plan of salvation to hear the gospel and through it believe in Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ. Be baptized into Him for the remission of sins. When you've done all that from the heart, you rise to walk in newness of life with the blessings of heaven upon you. So much to ascribe to God. So much to motivate us to worship God according to His will. So much to show us why we should pray to God according to the model prayer. Child of God, have you let these things slip? Have you depended on yourself? Have your mind been on the affairs of this present world when you're only one heart beat away from eternity? If so, you need to repent of such sins and pray God for forgiveness as you've confessed them, knowing that God, according to His will and His second law of pardon, will forgive you of every sin and you can once again be faithful to Him in the Lord's church. If you have any of those needs, then we ask you to consider closely these matters while together we stand and sing.